The warriors gathered around the slain creature. They did this warily, as they couldn't be sure it was entirely dead. After it lay there for several seconds, however, it became apparent it wasn't going to get back up. What is it? Vendar asked, abandoning their mostly ruined cover of stealth. It's like nothing I've ever encountered. Guala, have you seen its like before? The hunter said he had not, and that, furthermore, it seemed to be nothing of the natural world. I don't like anything about it, Vendar said. Everything about it just seems wrong, like it doesn't fit in this existence. I'm beginning to fear there is more happening here than any of us imagined, said Akmotesh slowly. In any case, let us finish what we came here to do. They continued to explore the passages of the second floor, each of them hoping not to encounter another of the foul beasts, or something worse, that had attacked them in the entry chamber. Soon they found themselves facing a red velvet curtain at the end of a short passage. Akmotesh threw this aside, revealing the sanctum of Ushtar Nin. It was a spacious circular gallery. At its edges there appeared to be a number of nooks, carved into the walls, which held a variety of crystals, scepters, scrolls, and other artifacts, the exact identities of which were difficult to discern in the low light. The middle of the chamber was a large raised disk, perhaps fifteen cubits across and surrounded on all sides by low steps leading up to it. Flanked by braziers and inscribed with strange symbols and patterns on its surface, this platform contained, at its center, a hooded figure sitting cross-legged. Are you the high priest, Ushtar Nin? Akmotesh said, striding forward. The figure rose to his feet with an eerie grace. His face was completely obscured by the hood. Dangling from a thong on his waist, Akmotesh noticed, was the odd star-shaped key needed to open the door to the tabernacle. I am. His voice was raspy and gurgling, and strangely muffled as though he were speaking from behind a mask or balaclava. Who is it that invades my sanctum? You are not one of the Brotherhood, though you wear the cloaks. We come seeking answers. Who are you, really? What purpose does this cult truly serve? I was a wizard once. I sought to wrest power from the gods, to learn the mysteries beyond the outer darks. And then I learned the truth. Of what do you speak? pressed Akmotesh. There are other realities than this, beyond the power of even the gods, more mysterious than the outermost reaches of space. Space is not beyond, but behind and between, places where the laws of this world hold no power, and where exist horrors beyond man's imagining. I have gazed into the void that lies between worlds and at the things that dwell therein. They have imparted to me their powers and their mysteries. Oh, it came at great personal expense, almost shattering my mind and warping my body. But the things I've seen, the things I've seen! You speak nonsense, said Akmotesh, attempting to feign frustration to mask his growing feeling of unsettlement. What of Zerzelzig? Zerzelzig is one of them, Ushtarnin croaked. It came to me when I opened the gate and promised me its power if I would help it grow. It needs meat, you see. Any kind will do, but it needs sentient meat to grow. I feed it, and in turn it gives me madness, glorious madness. Guala shook his head and said that clearly the man's sanity had departed if it had ever been there, been there to begin with. Akmotesh agreed, and together with Vendar began to advance on Ushtarnin. But ah, said the mad mage, you have come bearing the weapons of the metal that the void dwellers fear. You have come to kill us. <laughs> Fools, gaze upon the glory Zerzelzig has given me. With this, a long tentacle unraveled itself from within Ushtarnin's sleeve, while another hand, this one human, but of a sickly purple color and covered with strange tumors and sores, pulled back his hood. What it revealed was a face that had once been human, but was now warped into a ghastly parody of humanity. A pair of plier-like mandibles flanked a slack, flabby-lipped mouth. Well, meanwhile, an eye snaked from its socket on the end of a writhing stalk. A siphon, like one might see on an octopus, quivered at the base of the high priest's jaw, and where hair once had been, now existed only an array of throbbing red hemispheres that threatened to overgrow his remaining normal eye. Ushtarnin gestured toward the advancing warriors with his human hand as his tentacle appendage caressed his right temple. 
The same strange, muffled, gurgling voice spoke a jumble of nonsense syllables, and Akmotesh noticed that, oddly, the wizard's mouth didn't seem to be moving at all. Suddenly, a horrible sensation overtook Akmotesh's faculties. It was a pain the likes of which he had never before experienced, a shooting agony that seemed to fill every fiber of his body, and yet at the same time was completely intangible. It was as if something were attacking his mind rather than his physicality. He dropped to his knees, clutching his head in his hands. This didn't do anything to alleviate the pain, but he felt like he had to do something, anything, to try to ameliorate the sensation. He saw, meanwhile, from the corner of his eye, that his companions were doing the same. Agmotesh's head felt like it was about to explode, and yet he knew there was nothing physically wrong with his body. It was as if the mutated Ushtarnin were attacking with the power of his own mind. If that was the case, then Akmotesh was well equipped to fight back. He had pitted his iron will against magicians in the past, and his mental fortitude had been hardened by years upon years of religious asceticism. But most of all, his heart burned with a zealous fervor to see justice meted out as his god deemed fit. Nothing, neither man, nor beast, nor demon, nor ghost, not even the strange breed of unnatural monstrosity Zerzelzig and his spawn were, would stop him from serving Anubis. He clenched his teeth and willed his heart to burn with holy rage. With a savage growl, he shrugged off the pain and rushed forward, his sword aimed at Ushtar Nin's heart. Ushtar Nin, seeing the furious priest of Anubis dashing toward him with doom in his eye, lashed out his tentacle arm. It was longer than it looked, or perhaps it was able to expand its own length somehow. In any case, it snaked out with startling speed, winding itself around Akmotesh's neck and lifting him into the air. It squeezed tighter and tighter, like a constrictor snake threatening to choke the life out of him. But either Ushtarnin was too poorly versed in combat, or too insane to realize his foolish error in leaving both the war priest's arms free, and with a pair of savage hacks, Akmotesh amputated the appendage with his bronze sword. Both ends of the severed tentacle thrashed, squirting weird black ichor. Meanwhile, its owner screamed in, alarmingly, two voices, one being that with which he had addressed the three intruders, the other being an awful screech from the warped mouth on his face. Agmotesh wasted no time in closing the gap and plunging his sword into Ushtarnin's heart, or where his heart should have been. To the Chemite's surprise, it didn't kill him instantly, instead inciting the mutant Hierophant to claw at him with his remaining arm. Remembering the thing in the vestibule and how it, too, resisted lethal strikes, Agmotesh went for one attack he knew would succeed, withdrawing the blade and bringing it down with all his might on his foe's head. Touching as little of his slain enemy's carcass as necessary, Akmotesh plucked the star key from its place around the wizard's waist, then turned hurriedly away from the body, for he had realized something that unnerved him deeply. When he was face to face with the horrible abomination that had once been Ushtarnin, the latter screamed, but the scream was coming from somewhere under his cloak. The key to the tabernacle was now in the raiders' possession, but they weren't yet ready to face whatever horrors lay within. First, we must arm ourselves with the metal that Zerzelzig and his accursed kin fear, Akmotesh said. Hurriedly, the infiltrators descended the ziggurat back the way they had come, to the stash of supplies hidden at its base. Here they fully outfitted themselves with the bronze armaments which Akmotesh had, brought to, had thought to bring. A spear for Gwala, a double-bladed axe for Vendar, and for himself a sword made in the sickle-shaped fashion of his native chem. Breastplates and casks of bronze were also adorned, though in place of the latter, Akmotesh instead equipped his signature jackal-head helm, which he wore when carrying out his god's will. Sufficiently arrayed, they once more ascended the ziggurat to the topmost floor. Akmotesh paused as he prepared to insert the star-shaped key into its corresponding socket on the large metal door. Now we must steal ourselves for what lies beyond. Most likely will be something that will shatter our minds and wills, if not our bodies. Remember that countless lives depend on our success. Do not allow anything to undermine your resolve. Keep your gods in your hearts, and let justice guide your strikes. With that, Agmotesh inserted the star key, turning it to the right. The sound of various internal gears and pins could be heard clicking, followed by one final clunk indicating the gate was unlocked. Akmotesh pulled the doors open, and the weird red glow they had seen before came flooding out, 
followed by a stale and unnatural odor. Peering inside, they could see very little of note in the strange scarlet light, only a plain floor of what appeared to be some sort of smooth stone stretched off into the darkness. Then, suddenly, sound and noise came rushing out of the shadows, not those of some unholy star-spawned monstrosity, however, but of humans. Four people, white-cloaked figures, sprinted toward the open door, their faces masks of horror and sorrow. Agmotesh recognized them as members of the group that had been chosen earlier that night to enter the tabernacle. He was relieved he had managed to reach them in time, but his optimism was tainted by disappointment when he remembered there had initially been five. Let us out. Please, don't make us go back in, they pleaded. One of the individuals said nothing, having only the wide-eyed, oblivious stare of the insane. What happened in there? Akmotesh said, taking a frantic Amalia in his arms. We, she stammered, we, we went in, and then that, that thing, it, it ate him. She collapsed in a fit of frantic sobs. Akmotesh tried to comfort her. You're safe now. We're here to help. The Brotherhood of the Black Star is an evil cult that worships false gods of madness and insanity. We came to rescue you, but now your friends need your help. Their minds have been injured from what they've seen, so you must lead them. A short distance from this temple to the south is a small grove. Go there immediately and wait for us. Uh, are you going to kill that thing in there? she asked. Agbotesh paused for a minute. Yes, he said. Now go. The three warriors entered the tabernacle. All about them the strange red glow persisted. What is this place? Vendar whispered. Guala replied, stating he had the same thought, and adding to it that, while he was unable to see the walls, it almost seemed as though it was bigger inside than it was outside. They walked farther in. Vendar's grieved foot struck something on the floor, and the thing rolled and clattered a bit before coming to a stop. Looking down, he saw it was a human skull, and, here and there to complement it, were the scattered bones of a human skeleton. Looks like someone forgot to clean house he murmured. They walked in even farther, encountering more bones as they did. Eventually, the entrance became little more than a small rectangle of light in the distance behind them. They heard it before they saw it, an awful, wet, squishing noise as it approached, along with the sound of some immense bulk sliding across the stone. And then its horrible vocalizations began, a discordant gurgling noise that sounded almost human, but wrong in a way that set the nerves alight as it continually uttered nonsensical combinations of consonants. Out of the shadows it came, a huge indescribable mass that taxed the brain of those who saw it. It resembled a giant gastropod with tentacles upon tentacles branching from its bloated body and jointed chitinous appendages jutting this way and that. Strange siphons, orifices, and bulges riddled its bulk, each writhing and twitching obscenely. All of it defied natural law, and, while it would have driven lesser men to the brink of drooling madness, Akmotesh and his companions, their psyches already hardened by the horrors of the earth, had prepared themselves for such a monstrosity, their experiences on the floor below helping to prepare them further. With a champion's resolve, they stood their ground, ready to defend themselves. Suddenly, without warning, a mass of tentacles exploded from the front of the monster, cascading directly toward Akmotesh. Quick as he was, the battle-ready priest was un unable to defend himself from the writhing mass and soon found himself cocooned in tendrils and madness. Deprived of movement and sight, so complete was his entrapment, Akmotesh could only struggle in vain as the perverse monster dragged him with alarming speed toward itself and to the circular pit lined with dagger-like teeth from which its tentacles came. Guala released one of his bronze arrows which sunk into Zerzelzig's indescribable body, and it seemed to have an effect, causing a repulsive, peristalsis-like contraction to ripple through the mass. It kept a firm hold on Akmotesh, however, pulling him closer and closer to its hellish maw. Vendar, meanwhile, ran to the beast, hoping to be able to sever the tendrils in time to free his ally, but the tentacles dragged one step faster than the swift warrior could run. Soon they had retracted completely, and with them, their stalwart prize. For a moment, Akmotesh was submerged in darkness, bathed in an unpleasant warm moisture and surrounded by the worst aroma he had ever smelled. All about him he sensed the presence of sharp, knife-like projections which threatened to slice his flesh as easily as a razor cuts through paper if he made even the slightest move. 
He had little time to think about how to escape from this duress, however, when he suddenly found himself expelled back out the way he had come. With a violent wretch, Zerzelzig, its mouth filled with the taste of its prey's coppery exoskeleton, vomited out the unsuitable meal. Agmotesh, momently, momentarily disoriented, and now covered in a sort of mucus which would have caused him to lose his normally stoic bearing had he not been ready to fight for his life, scrambled to his feet. He had maintained a grip on his kopesh the whole time, only losing it when he hit the ground, and now it lay a meter away. Quickly he moved to rearm himself. During all of this, Guala had continued to fire arrows into the monster, and, while Zerzelzig still seemed strong, it became apparent the projectiles were chipping away at its endurance. But before it could move to contend with the source of the threat, it had another, more immediate one to attend with, the axe-wielding warrior who now stood next to it, valiantly sweeping his weapon to and fro as he severed tentacles and fended off claws. Several times, Zerzelzig's appendages threatened to grasp Vendar, but these attempts were thwarted, either by the hero himself or by the sword of Akmotesh, who had now rushed to fight side by side with the mercenary. Blades slashed and thrust, arrows pierced, tentacles and claws fell to the ground, and, though the warriors were unsure of just where exactly the heart and brain of this offense to nature lay, Zerzelzig at length gave one final gibbering bellow, spewed forth a gout of vile liquid, and lay still. <laughs> well, that's one for the poets, Vendar said as he wiped his brow. Today is the day we killed a god. Though Zerzelzig had been slain, there were still some loose ends that needed to be tied before Akmotesh, Gwala, and Vendar left the high temple of the Brotherhood of the Black Star. They wasted little time in leaving the strange red lambent hell which had served as Zerzelzig's lair, and the cool night air smelled especially sweet after that foul-smelling and improbable chamber of nightmares. After taking a few moments to rest and collect their sanity, they returned to the sanctum of Ushtar Nin, for here Akmotesh wished to seek out the means which the wizard had used to draw Zerzelzig and its kin from whatever insane plane of existence they had come. Also, though the priest of Anubis had little interest in wealth, his crusades required funds, and wizards often hoarded much of value which could be looted and sold in to turn a considerable profit. Vendar was particularly interested in this. In the mage's sanctum they found a variety of curious artifacts. Some of these were typical of a wizard's paraphernalia, such as prisms, wands, scrolls, runes, and modified human body parts the last of which Akmotesh appropriated with the intent on consecrating and interring at a later time. Others were more abstruse in their use, such as strange brass wheels with articulating parts and inscriptions of the sun, moon, and stars, or a wand with discs of glass at either end. Most notable of all, however, was a book. It was a thick volume, bound in leather, with its yellowed pages inscribed in a curious red ink. Akmotesh cautiously leafed through its pages, his brow furrowing as he observed its contents. Much of it was written in a chaotic and haphazard manner, with its words disobeying the conventions of typical literary script, instead running from top to bottom, left to right, around the margins, and sometimes even in spirals, as though it were the notebook of a madman rather than the tome of a scholar. And Akmotesh could have easily dismissed it as such, but in its pages he could find not only madness, but also wisdom of a sanity greater than his own. The book contained phrases and figures that hinted at powerful spells of summoning beyond what his limited knowledge of the arcane could comprehend, and in sundry places existed diagrams and geometrical figures that defied logic, but made sense in a way he couldn't quite grasp. Sometimes the words changed into various languages, some that the polyglot priest could read, others that were unlike any tongue he had ever encountered before, and still others that seemed no more than gibberish. Perhaps most disturbing of all were the sketches of landscapes and creatures that no healthy mind rooted in reality could comprehend, and Akmotesh would have liked to have been able to disregard them as the fever dreams of the mad, had some of them not borne resemblances to the abominations they had encountered that night. Finally, when Akmotesh could no longer ignore the feeling of revulsion that had been building in the very core of his psyche since laying hands on the book, he clapped it shut, his eyes resting once more on the words embossed on the volume's cover, words written in an old and obscure desert tongue. Keys and gates. I need to make sure no one else gets their hands on this tome, Akmotesh said as he took the book into his possession. I will take it back to my sanctum and attempt to destroy it there. 
though if my suspicions are right, I doubt it will be an easy task. But first, there's one more thing we need to take care of. Guala spoke. Yes, Neothophilus, Akmotesh said in reply. We need him deposed in order to fully sever the snake's head. What should we do with the mage's body? Vendar asked. Leave it where it is. The cultists will need it as evidence of what was truly happening here. The warriors had little difficulty gaining entrance to Neothophilus's personal chambers. The hour was late, so there were few people to question the entrance of armed and battle-scarred warriors, albeit cloaked in the Brotherhood's garb, into the first-floor enclosures. The false priest's personal quarters were guarded, of course, but the spells and poisons of Akmotesh's discipline made short work of this obstacle. At length, the party found themselves in the chamber of Neothophilus. Here, a large and luxurious bed heaped with furs dominated the center of the room, while the faux priest sat bent over a richly lacquered writing desk, busily scrawling on a piece of vellum when the door flew open with a raucous bang to reveal three armed warriors bedecked with brotherhood robes. Neothophilus of the Brotherhood of the Black Star, death has come for you, Akmotesh said as they entered. Who are you? What's the meaning of this? said Neothophilus indignantly, jumping to his feet. The time of the Brotherhood is at an end. Ushtar Nin and the false god Zerzelzig have been executed. As for you, you may surrender peacefully or share their fate. Akmotesh expected either anger and resistance or, more likely, begging and pleading for mercy, but instead the false hierophant simply breathed a tired sigh of relief. <sighs> Good. It's as it should be. This had gone much too far. "'What are you talking about?' asked Vendar. "'Don't pretend you weren't in on all of this.' "'Oh, I won't claim I'm innocent,' Neothophilus said, "'lowering himself into a slouch on the edge of his bed. "'I knew from the very beginning this whole thing was a sham. "'I never knew exactly what Ushtar Nin had in that room up there, "'but I knew it wasn't a kind and benevolent god. "'I didn't care. "'I've always been a con man, "'and what difference was it to me "'if a few gamblers or derelicts got killed? "'I got money, power, women. "'It was a good deal.' Except, as time went by, Ushtar Nin began to change. His sanity began to degrade, and his body began to change into, into something not human. Even worse, horrible things started flocking to him. Things from somewhere other than here. Neothophilus' face twisted into a mask of revulsion. You've obviously been up there. You know. Anyway, meanwhile, more and more people began coming here, and I knew that Ushtar Nin was going to lead us all straight to hell, or someplace worse. Guala spoke. Yeah, said Vendar. Why didn't you try to stop him? No, I couldn't. He was a powerful wizard. I saw him turn a man inside out once. I wasn't about to let that happen to me. I wasn't powerful enough to stop him. But you were? Akmotesh nodded. Are you going to do the same to me? Neothophilus didn't sound frightened. Rather, he carried in his voice an air of weariness and resignation. Anubis has decreed that you should live this day, but know that the time will come when you will stand before him in the Hall of Two Truths, where your deeds in this world will be weighed on his scales of judgment, and you have much to atone for should you wish to avoid the jaws of Amit, who devours the souls of the unworthy. Having removed the linchpins that kept the Brotherhood of the Black Star together, Akmotesh and his companions decided to depart from the High Temple the same way they had come, as thieves in the night, discreetly and silently, as Akmotesh doubted they would have praises and thanks heaped upon them by the members of the Brotherhood for killing their god. Nonetheless, he tried his best to plant the seeds of healing before he left. "'What are we to do now?' Amalia lamented when she was informed Zerzelzig was destroyed." Everything I've come to know these past years, everything that gave my life purpose, was a lie. Was it? Akmotesh asked. Yes, the Brotherhood itself was a lie, created for the advancement of an evil man and the demon he worshipped. But there were truths to be had, powerful and good truths, and those truths will persist without the corruption of Ushtar Nin and Zerzelzig. And the gods still watch over us. True, they may not live on this earth, but they see and watch over all, and they are closer than you realize. With this being said, Akmotesh and his companions moved on. "'There's one thing I don't quite understand about all of this,' Vendar asked as they left the ziggurat behind them. "'What was Ushtarnin's goal, anyway? I can understand if he had been using his position for power and wealth, as Neothophilus seemed to be doing, but in the end it seemed like the only thing his efforts got him was to serve as a slave for Zerzelzig.' "'Who's to say?' came the priest's reply. 
The motives of those who dabble in the arcane and the forbidden tend to elude the understanding of laymen, perhaps yet a greater end that we can only guess at, or, just as likely, if not more so, perhaps he was insane, either from the start or driven that way by his dabblings in that which man was not meant to know. In any case, he's dead now. You realize how unbelievable your story is? It was more of a statement than a question. Once again, Akmotesh III stood before the tribunal of the Church of Aeus as he related his entire account of how he dismantled the Brotherhood of the Black Star. You may believe it or not as you wish, he replied simply, but in the end the Brotherhood is dismantled. That's what matters. As it turns out, we do believe you, said another of the stern-faced priests. We are old and have seen many things that even the most superstitious of men would be skeptical about. This is not the first time we have seen the mischief wrought by the forbidden tome, keys, and gates. You say the book uh, disappeared? the tribunal asked. That's correct. I had intended to transport it back to my sanctum, where I would destroy it with fire and ritual. Only it wasn't to be found in the warded satchel in which I had placed it. How can you be sure it wasn't stolen by your companions? I thrust Guala implicitly. He would never take it. There are things I don't know about Vendar, but I sense a strong sense of honor within him. Regardless, I made sure to keep the book with me at all times. This doesn't surprise us. The book is uh, surprisingly elusive. It seems to have a habit of finding its way into the hands of those who would uh, use it to further their own power while avoiding those that would wish to uh, destroy it. Another of the priests spoke. In any case, you have served the Church of A.S. well, Akmotesh of Kem, and for that we offer our support and thanks. Henceforth, you are free to practice your religion within the city walls, free from taxation and church interference. Go now with our blessing. But, added another, should you again come across keys and gates in your travels, bring it to us. We know of it and can deal with the tome accordingly." As Akmotesh left the tribunal's hall, he thought to himself that, if he did indeed ever encounter the book again, he certainly wouldn't put it in their hands.